cool, thanks. Um, so if you guys just heard Dr. Salsa's talk, uh, similar flavor, different applications, um, but the idea of generating more information from different kind of sources, be it whole site images or really high resolution images of biopsies is something that has been an idea for like 15 years, um, but really um, has only really come to life and as you know, vendors are selling them as products nowadays. Um, but most importantly, uh, the 2012-ish, you know, with the, with the advent of convolutional neural networks, uh, the pa whole pattern recognition game, uh, you know, took a took a whole new direction. So we're leveraging some of those technologies. Um, you know, have a have a full uh, lab in house that we're working on developing some algorithms and um, applying it to some really cool data sets that we've acquired. Um, so, like I would mention. Um, working in like computational pathology is, is the new way to say it. So when we started the company about four years ago, uh, which is basically most of my adult life, um, <laughs> we were working with these rule-based computer vision systems, um, like Dr. Saltz was kind of mentioning, where we were basically creating object detection and segmentation algorithms for uh, nuclei, tubules, glands, uh, different histological structures. And the idea with pathology is that a doctor looks at a composite feature set of all of these individual features and basically looks at aggregate statistics for a given slide and then compares it against population statistics. So the idea is pretty fundamental science that you take one observation, compare it against a lot more observations that have labels, and then try and predict the label of the one without the label. However, in practice, uh, especially only equipped with a light microscope, the same thing that you use in seventh grade biology class, um, it becomes pretty tough, and, and ultimately, it's really bad for patients, and patients get misdiagnosed, and insurance companies pay a lot of money um, because patients get treated with the wrong treatments. And those endpoints, those clinical endpoints, are how we see pathology changing, and we see an opportunity to bring pathology and this really manual discipline with microscopes and all this old school technology that I think is pr not only I, but I think many people would agree is kind of ridiculous that it's still used in the age of MRIs and sequencing and you know, all this exabyte data that's generated. We're still using light, micro light microscopes. And I think that there's a huge opportunity to uh, integrate some of these pathomic or computational pathology metrics into the world of uh, precision medicine. Um, so what we're looking at here is an H&E section, like Dr. Saltz was mentioning, uh, is kind of like the canonical stain that you look at in order to determine stru uh, structure. So in sequencing, something that's lost is spatial heterogeneity. So spatial relationships with different kinds of cells is actually really important. And if you go by the World Health, the World Health Organization guidebook on how to diagnose cancer, uh, definitely doesn't say anything about, you know, sequencing a million, you know, base pairs and coming up with some correlations. It talks about looking at patterns. And so we, what we want to do is take that manual pattern recognition, beef it up with some computational power, and then take it to the next level and correlate it with these clinical endpoints. So has anybody here read Flatland? Okay, well, I was trained in classical mathematics, and I, I, I know it's the 21st century and it's 2017 because I was trained in classical math, and I give talks at computer science conferences and medical conferences now, which is crazy. But... The idea is this book was like this, in two-dimensional space, if you're a triangle, your goal is to become a circle, right? And the way you become a circle is you add edges. Well, you can, never, you can, have, you can add infinitely many edges and you'll never become a circle. Uh, this like perfect circle is their like pursuit of life, I guess you could say. And I like making the analogy from precision medicine being similar to this pursuit. And indulge me, if you will. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I think it's really interesting because people are just throwing data and data and data at, you know, what, what more can we measure? But they're neglecting the thing that is measured, which is, that is estimated visually. And I think that is, uh, you know, gross negligence to an extent, um, or maybe missed opportunity at best. Um, so I think there's a lot of, a lot of reasons that you can, um, you know, leverage digital pathology and computational pathology be it with these rule-based computer vision cell segmentation systems that we were developing, um, all the way through pattern recognition, you know, tumor detection, and then correlation with genomic endpoints. 
Um, so with a lot of new treatments as well, it's something to talk about is that, you know, the reason why the pre precision medicine exists is because there's more treatments, right? You don't just unilaterally chop the person's arm off if they have skin cancer on their left finger. You come up with new treatment options. There's immunotherapy, which is really awesome and obviously is way less cytotoxic than th things like chemotherapy. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of cost implications with this as well, which is great for us running a, running a company based off this premise. So uh, the, our thesis is that computational pathology reopens the door uh, for the pursuit of the optimal cancer diagnosis. So getting that regular, tr you know, that regular polygon as close to a circle as possible. And even though we'll never be able to, you know, as a limited approach to infinity on the number of sides, we, we kind of, you know, asymptote out. But, uh, you know, hopefully we, 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 our goal is to provide the clinic with, with the information that they need to put the patient on the right track uh, for the right therapies. And as all these new checkpoint inhibition therapies come through and who knows what else is going to happen. I mean, modern medicine's only been around for like 100 years or something, I think, uh, which is, to me, seems like a long time. But I think in the scope of, of how long illnesses has been around is, is really nothing. So I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, so this is really where we see things moving. So we're using, this is an example of a computer vision technique that we developed. So this is cell segmentation. This, so this is an immunohistochemical marker. Um, this is HER2. And her, what HER2 uh, signifies is if a, if, a, if a patient with breast cancer uh, has, a, has a high expression of HER2, uh, she's, she's, el she's eligible for the Herceptin treatment, which is a hormonal therapy that's uh, less um, cytotoxic than chemotherapy. And the way that we measure things in medicine is, you know, you create Kaplan-Meier curves, which are survival versus time. And then w when you see distinct survival curves, you know that that's a phenotype, basically. And this is still a pretty discrete description, right? The, you know, just because the curve looks like this and another curve, you know, goes a little bit lower and, and there's not as much survival on, on a given time interval, doesn't mean that there are two discrete patient populations. So something that we're working on is kind of creating a continuous spectrum, which as a mathematician, I look at <laughs> how are you gonna classify you know, a, a, a unique observation into a three set classification system. And I mean, we see that with, with everything and we're still limited by um, you know, the enzymatic reactions of the uh, antibodies working on the protein epitopes to precipitate this brown color. And we're also limited by the fact that we're dealing with a dynamic range of two to the eight bits once it's digitized. Um, so obviously, we're, this is not the perfect circle that we're looking for, but it's pretty damn close. So we're pretty happy with it. Um, so these, this is a commercially available product that we're working on and refining and developing for different antibodies. And as you see here, um, if anybody's familiar with computer vision, uh, very much an object detection approach. Same thing that you would look at if you were trying to pick out, uh, you know, corn plants from the sky or something, or vice versa, if you're at the sky and looking at galaxies, it's the same kind of spatial imagery technology. Um, yeah, but what really becomes interesting is when you look at that in context of a bigger problem. So what you see here on the left is a, is a semantic segmentation generated heat map on uh, prostate cancer tissue. So what this does is allow us to isolate the epithelial regions, which is like the, where the cancer grows. So when the cancer moves from one place to another, it goes from in situ to invasive, which is bad, obviously. And when it spreads outside of your main organ that it develops in, that's extra bad. So what we, what we want to do is track where is it, why is it spreading, what cells are spreading, and can we stop it from spreading. Um, so what we have to do is separate that tumor region. So in order to do this, we work with big, with big hospital systems and pathology labs, both commercial, uh, government, and academic. Um, and we aggregate these really large data sets full of these whole site images that are up to two, three gigs in size, and they're an image pyramid. So when you look at the slides, you can, look at, you can query regions on 1x, 5x, 10x, 20x, sometimes up to 40x. Uh, magnification of the original view, which is clearly really powerful. Um, so, you know, usually when we do these kind of tumor detection things, uh, you know, we aggregate up to 1,000, 2,000 slides, and then we get pathologists to use our software and annotate them. So I know 
the dude who spoke before me talked about um, using Photoshop to trace the uh, veins, which I thought was crazy. Uh, we developed a, a software system to kind of facilitate this annotation and uh, source really quality ground truth data. Um, and if anybody you know, is not affiliated with an academic medical center and works with medical images, you know how hard it is to acquire them and source quality reproducible data. So working with consensus panels to you know, look at the intersection of the annotations, looking at uh, you know, making sure that the stain quality is the same, it's really, it's really, it's really a, an interesting problem in uh, you know, preserving um, morphological properties. And when I say morphological, I mean like set, like the way cells look. Um, so once you identify the tumor, the next step is to kind of go in and you, you go from a global to a local view so you can actually measure properties of the cells. So this is where that original idea that we developed four years ago comes into play. Um, so a lot of people are doing digital pathology, the AI stuff now. Right? A lot of people are looking at the space. Um, I'm sure you guys read some of the papers from Stanford and Harvard, and you know, some of these guys are working on some interesting problems. But you know, what they saw was an opportunity for deep learning um, applied to AI, which is like cl clearly the way to do it in terms of pattern recognition. But we really have to go a step further um, and look at the cellular structures in order to really understand the cancer. Otherwise, we would just be kind of uh, perpetuating this, uh, this like estimation paradigm in pathology, which is not what we want to do. We don't want to just go microscope to monitor and then have an estimation of tumor boundary, which actually has no bearing on predicting response or predicting any other clinical endpoint. What you have to do is look at the cellular structures. Um, so that's what we are looking at here. So this is the high-resolution view of the, um, the, the uh, tumor cells in the, uh, the region that we detected. And what we do is we generate these really high-dimensionality feature vectors that encode not only you know, color um, in different color spaces, not only like general, you know, like hair lake, kind of this old school way to do pattern recognition, you know, right? Like, when, is, anybody, is anybody here familiar with wind charm? It was, yeah, it was a really awesome, um, kind of like the first thing that I ever played around with in ter terms of pattern recognition. It was a software system developed at the NIH, and they had, they just developed, they just created this incredibly high dimension, dimensional um, feature vector of texture features with different um, uh, histogram bucket, with different bins of, of a histogram, and they would just average these in like 40,000 features representing a single image, and they would do some, you know, they had some dimensionality reduction technique and then they, I think it was like Fisher weighting, um, where they would, uh, it wasn't PCA, but I think it was Fisher weighting. Um, really interesting, and yeah, that was kind of the first way that I ever looked at pattern recognition. Um, and then, you know, when convolutional neural networks came around, that was the logical choice for us to move to. Um, however, we still follow that same paradigm in terms of really high dimensionality feature extraction. Um, it, but what we're able to do is not only look at the properties of the individual cells, but we can encode the architecture one, two, three, four degrees away. And that's what pathologists attempt to do. They attempt to say, oh, there's a tumor cell here. How does it relate to other tumor cells? So in sequencing, you lose that data. You lose that spatial information. And we're, pre we're attempting to pre preserve that as well as possible. Um, so I think that that is, in terms of the biological intuition about why this stuff works, um, you know, anything that has to do with computational pathology, uh, people are going to try and convince you guys that deep learning is this cipher into things, um, and I, I kind of reject that. I think that it's a, it opens the door, uh, but to really go the whole way, you have to be able to look at the cellular structures, um, which I, I think any, any pathologist would probably agree with. Um, but once again, like I mentioned earlier, the whole point of this is, you know, what, we're just going to put this, this cool, these cool visualizations and these heat maps up on a pedestal, now we want to tie it to clinical endpoints to eventually drive therapeutic options to drive precision medicine is the idea. Um, so, you know, I don't want to say replacing sequencing, but you know, we're looking at supplementing sequencing data, and there's you know some applications that we've shown um, with lower grade glioma. Um, so, that, remember, if, if Dr. Saltz talked about th that that in, that midpoint bet the um, between the ogliodendrogliomas and the astrocytomas which is a brain cancer kind of paradigm. And these pathologists create these discrete systems because that's how they saw response to therapies. They said, this person 
this phenotype exists because it responds differently to therapies. It exists because it is a different patient, but that's still a one, there's still a oglio-dendroglioma astrocytoma or a mixture of the two, which is not the way things work in real life because there's uneven mixtures and there's weights and, um, you know, things don't, things don't uh, distribute evenly. So what we're looking to do is create continuous spectrums of response data for people that have, let's say that they're on a 0.2 on a 100-point scale. You know, they're, they have a little bit of oglio-dendroglioma, but they're primarily astrocytoma. Then you wouldn't need those three discrete buckets, and you could still encode the information rather than just getting rid of one and looking at only two, which I'm not sure helps anything. Um, so this is an example here. Um, so this is a prostate cancer uh, core biopsy. Uh, so here we used um, patch-based classification. So there's kind of two ways to source the ground truth. There's patch by patch. So when you look at this, you know, this is a huge image. So when you, when you use these patches, it's, like, it's not independent. They're not independent patches. They're, uh, it's kind of a Humpty Dumpty approach where you go from the, the, big, the big image and then deconstruct it and then rebuild it. Hopefully when you rebuild it, you don't just rebuild the same, you know, X, Y, here's the pixel X, Y, here's those three color channels. Hopefully you rebuild something with more information, like a heat map, where the color channels become probability of being tumor, probability of being metastatic cancer, probability of whatever that measurement is that you're looking for in order to, to predict your endpoint. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind the image processing of this. Um, it's really cumbersome. Uh, there's some open source libraries for encoding the different scanner APIs. Uh, sorry, the different scanner, the different image formats. Because um, there's Philips, uh, like a couple other vendors, create these images. Um, and so you have to be able to, to encode it. But basically what we do is software only. So we look at this. So yeah, so this was a, um, this was, we had this, must be, a year ago now, um, so this was patch-based, so this was uh, VGG, um, and uh, we, we published on this, and there's some, um, you know, like the hyperparameters and stuff are public, I think. Um, but as you can see, this is, a, this is a probability from blue to red uh, of a color map of likelihood of being cancer. So when we isolate those regions, we can generate this really high dimensional feature vector um, about the cells, the, the, the cell nuclei, and then when we do that, we can find correlations with a bunch of really prognostically important uh, genomic endpoints, even things like disease-free survival, overall survival, um, and a really important thing in prostate cancer is uh, P10 loss. And we're working with some investigators at Johns Hopkins that are looking at P10 loss as a really important marker for um, uh, response to immunotherapy and uh, prostate cancer. And another really cool thing that's different from sequencing data is that this doesn't destroy the tissue, and you do it with a standard histology prep. So it costs like a lot of money to sequence, to, to crush up the tissue and put it in the blender, and it gets some base pair data out of that. And we have shown that you can, for a lot of different use cases, you can basically get that information um, from the standard histology prep uh, by scanning the image and using our software. So. I see two, um, <laughs> not, not, to, not to be a hypocrite here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create two discrete buckets of ways that you can use that, that digital pathology, computational pathology, have an have a, you know, opportunity in precision medicine. Uh, the first being automation, and the second being augmentation. So automation is this idea of increasing efficiency through workflow optimization, so pre-screening, um, reducing error rates, making pathologists go faster, or making them go the same rate and having to do less slides, or whatever it means. And for labs, that means more money. It means less pathologists. I said it. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that, that's some of the really cool uh, you know, use cases for automation. And then augmentation is the really cool stuff. That's the predictive, the biomarkers, the you're going to respond like this. Uh, maybe don't treat this person because their prognosis is really bad. Um, pancreatic cancer is something that's really has benefited really greatly from uh, image-based markers. Uh, the prognosis for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is really terrible. Um, however, there are certain phenotypes and certain 2%, 3% survival 
And you want to be able to identify the people that are going to respond to the treatment for pancreatic cancer. Um, however, identifying that is somewhat difficult. Um, so in order to deliver this, this stuff, uh, these algorithms, these, these metrics, these feature sets, uh, we had to build digital pathology software. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, this is just a quick overview of our distribution system. So this is the commercially available software, but the reason why we built it in the first place, our goal from day one has been to develop these algorithms to impact cancer diagnosis, to impact treatment, um, but we had to develop this software uh, to do it. And what we do and what this has enabled is global collaboration. So this is a cloud-based software system. So we're sourcing annotations and ground truth from all over the world. So we're working with a really big lab in Korea, some people in the EU, South America. Um, I think we're in 140, or sorry, 40 countries. Um, sourcing data, getting ground truth. And what's especially interesting is some of the applications that we're building are really uh, like region specific. So in Asia, um, gastric cancer takes a much different form than it does in America. So identification of early gastric cancer um, and, and lung cancer in Asia is much more important than it is in America because there's prognostic indications. So when we're developing these algorithms and we're looking at the space, we're looking first at the prognostic indication, then backtracking, sourcing the data set, and then working back towards that endpoint. Uh, so that's just kind of to give some context on how we're doing this and wh why we're focusing on these things. So what you see here on the left is uh, quantitative IHC, so this is a computer vision approach um, for uh, tumor microenvironment co uh, co contexture. Uh, somebody asked before about you know, looking at like seven, tenplex. So this is uh, light, this is still light microscopy, not fluorescence, so we're still limited to, um, you know, three, three color channels and uh, 256 square uh, cubed uh, discrete pixels. So unfortunately, we can't, we can't really eight, eight or nine plex this, but uh, there's a lot of information for looking at co-localization of proteins because, you know, cancer treatments attack proteins on cells. Um, so being able to look at the fact that proteins are expressing um, is really the most, one of the more direct ways of getting um, an understanding if a patient will respond to treatment. Um, but the really cool stuff that we're working on is, is, uh, is AI-based. Um, it has is, it is really taken over uh, all of my time and my interests. Um, you know, I, I'm sure in the next couple years, I, I would have never, four years ago, I would have never thought that digital pathology would be in three or four talks at an artificial intelligence conference. That's not what we were doing. It, it was not artificial intelligence. It was, it was really basic science um, with some cool computer science applications and computer vision and image processing, but it was not artificial intelligence. Um, now it is, and it's awesome. And you know, people, are, people are looking at the space now, and like Dr. Saltz mentioned with the uh, F first FDA approval of the whole site imaging system, um, I think it's realistic to, realistic to expect to see uh, real AI tools in the clinic in, in a very, you know, sooner than you might think. Um, so what I want to do, do now is kind of switch gears and talk about uh, the, th work that, the work that we're doing in artificial intelligence. Um, n as you see here, this is kind of a, a, a nice little picture of, you know, how, how one might change their view of looking at cancer from just looking at those, you know, what's the difference between looking at a slide under a microscope and then looking at, a, at the monitor? Uh, you might have, like, you can make an argument that, like, the, the color spectrum is, con is condensed when it's scanned because of the dynamic range of the computer. Um, I don't think any pathologist is going to complain about their dynamic range. Um, but they might complain that what's the point and why, why, you know, why relearn a new way of doing something they've been classically trained in. Um, so when you add, when you, when you change these pixels from being their standard three, three color channels in position to ha you know, encoding probability information about cancer, it, it really changes the game. Um, so yeah, so what, what, what I wanna talk about with, with, with respect to NVIDIA is um, data augmentation and just how great their machines are in terms of training models. So we uh, are working on a lot of different problems. So we're looking at diseases, that we're looking at brain, uh, genitourinary, gastrointestinal, um, 
lung, uh, so you know different thoracic diseases. Um, so we're really looking at a lot of different things. So we're you know we're training up to 15 different versions of models, at least 15 different versions of models at a time, sometimes up to 50 or 60. Uh, we have a really high throughput computing environment that we've worked on. Uh, we do all of our computing remote uh, through AWS. We fire up these, you know, the, the P2 instances are uh, massive. Um, you know, there's the, the 192 gigs of video memory and all, all this stuff just completely, it just puts my, I'm, I'm able to sleep at peace knowing that my models are training, and I'm not going to get a memory error. I'm not going to get something, because that's how things were five years ago. Um, even just dealing with these, you know, those, those texture features, we would still, I'd wake up, I, I had to have a, a shell script set that sets that, that to an alarm on my phone, and it wakes me up, and I'm like, God, God I have to, I have to go do this. <laughs> and, then I'd, and then I would have to go, to go to the lab or something, and it, was, it wasn't good. Um, so now we're able to, to really just rely on this heavily, and I think that, um, you know, we're really excited about some of the tensor processing and stuff, um, and I'll, I'll talk more later about some of our kind of state-of-the-art things that we're moving towards, uh, and how we have an opportunity to push the, you know, the boundaries of AI, um, in, you know, in our company. Uh, the other thing is data augmentation. Uh, the ophthalmology guy mentioned how important that is. So for us, not having to increase the cardinality of the data set is really important, uh, but still being able to, you know, this data is ro it's rotationally invariant, uh, not scale invariant. Uh, a cell that is one micron in diameter is much different than a cell that is two microns in diameter. Um, in terms of the way that a pathologist or the way that a computer would interpret its label, cancer, not cancer, benign, stroma. Um, so, yeah, that's really important. So, uh, we do a lot of data augmentation and, you know, sourcing this data and getting the annotations is difficult logistically. Um, so, being able to increase the cardinality of the data set without completely destroying our storage is really great. So, being able to do that in place with digits is solid and obviously we use CUDA um, as, like, the baseline. Um, so, this is a cool application of kind of some of the more, uh, researchy things that we're working on. So we're developing products um, that are that are AI focused and, and the back end is is you know, very much deep learning uh, in terms of you know different tumor recognition and, and cell profiling. Uh, but in order to do that, right, you have to you have to build the, the scaffolding to get there. And that's where we get to explore and, and, and do some research. And that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit. So in order to build a software system that can source images medical images from anywhere in the world, you have to be able to adapt to the different staining protocols, to the different lab quality procedure, quality assurance procedures. Uh, so we developed stain normalization techniques. So this image on the left here is an image that I was, we were given. This is something that the machine saw. Um, this is super oversaturated. It's a bad stain, histotech messed up. Uh, a pathologist would see this probably and send it back to the lab and say, no, nah, I'm not doing it. Um, well, <laughs> we want to, we you know, not have that happen too much. Um, and also sometimes they're not always this bad. Um, but what, what, what we can do is, is create a source and a target. So this is our target. This is a nice, healthy stain. And if there's anybody in the room that looks at cells, you can see that these are tumor cells with prominent nucleoli. Some are even dividing and turning into tetrapoid cells because um, they have multiple nucleoli. And I think that, you know, this is just an example of something that we did um, testing-wise. And then this was the output. So this is, the, this is image A um, after the GAN um, was able to basically style transfer. Like, if you, the really cool application out there with the, with the real-time style transfer. Somewhat similar to that um, in terms of the uh, implementation of this. Um, so what we did was, yeah, so we used a feature preserving loss function to avoid the conditional GAN loss, which I noticed was particularly bad um, in not really allowing this full, full transfer. Uh, we explored some strict, some strict color space transformations, um, and we've, we found empirically uh, that this, this seems to work better. Uh, it's also a really cool application. Um, 
another really cool thing that we've worked on is, like I mentioned before, we have these two uh, cell quantification suites that are like commercially available. Um, and so when a, when a case comes through and they're looking for more information for precision medicine, you, a, a pathologist will call for the, for the, for the IHC, for, for HER2, for example. Uh, this is, the, this is uh, H&E and P10, which is, I mentioned was really important for P10 loss is a really important prognostic indicator of response to immunotherapy and prostate cancer. Um, so something that we worked on was uh, using that H&E stain to synthesize an image of P10 loss. So this is uh, using a context-aware generative, generative adversarial network. Um, so we auto-synthesize some of the common markers. Uh, this is just a really cool application. Uh, you know, still working on, you know, beta testing this and, and getting this out there. But I think that there's, in terms of applicability to the clinic, I think that there's a lot of uh, opportunity here. Um, and there's a lot of really other, you know, a lot of other really interesting problems. Obviously, you know, we work a lot on the construction of convolutional neural networks for, um, you know, image rec for, for image classification. So basically, either for patch-based classification or the semantic segmentation, where we can preserve those boundaries really well, which is important. Um, but in terms of kind of what we're doing on a on a really exp experimental level, this is this is one of the examples. But ultimately, uh, all these things really tie together when you look at an application, when you look at something that you can solve in the clinic. So um, in, in Asia, a very important, um, and, and also in America to some extent, uh, surgery is a standard treatment option for patients with stage one non-small cell lung cancer. Um, but despite surgery, around 40% of patients with discrete lesions and histologically negative lymph nodes. So a TNM staging system looks at the primary tumor, the lymph nodes, and then the distant metastasis. And so if it metastasizes to the lymph nodes, it gets a up on the N scale. If it, you find it in your brain, it goes up on the M scale. Uh, more ups, worse it is. Uh, so what we need to do is, oh, sorry, I didn't finish my thought here. Um, you have discrete lesions and histologically negative lymph nodes die of recurrent disease. Uh, so what we have to do is figure out who those people are, and there's a surgical procedure that's called a lipectomy, um, which we don't want to do that often, right? Like, you don't want to do an invasive procedure if you don't have to, but if there's the off chance that a patient's not going to respond or is going to recur or whatever that endpoint is, um, you have to make sure that you address that, so... Right now, uh, the best performing genomic marker is RB1 mutation, uh, which does indicate um, poor prognosis for early stage lung cancer, but it's seldom found. So a lot of the patient population is left unaddressed. Um, so even if you were to screen every single patient with, with early non-small cell lung cancer uh, for the RB1 mutation, you would, s you would only see, you know, whatever, 3% response or something like that. Um, so what we looked at was the primary tumor histology um, to basically stratify uh, these, pa these patient populations from low risk of recurrence to high risk of recurrence. Um, and there's a direct, direct therapeutic implication um, from active surveillance and follow-up to chemo with or without targeted therapy based on the mutation type. Um, so I think that this application is um, kind of the culmination of the entire precision medicine model that wouldn't be made possible without computational pathology. And, you know, there's a lot of intricacies into the technology that we developed here, but the basic idea is that we took a really high dimensionality feature vector from the inside of a convolutional neural network and used, a, used those features. Um, I'm not going to go into the construction of the network, but uh, that's, the, that's the idea. And that goes back to the same thing that I was doing four years ago, you're using this, these high dimensionality texture features from WindCharm, uh, that was an open source NIH project. Uh, and adding more information opens the door for completion, um, or at least for bridging the gap between the molecular side of pathology and the pattern side of pathology, which is very important for prognosis. Um, so, yeah, that is where I want to do a little plug here. 
if anybody, if you're a developer, if you know developers, we're hiring a lot of people to work on artificial intelligence, um, full time, part time. Uh, we're really building out this laboratory of, of computer scientists and engineers and looking for really sharp people to come work with us. So I think that is all I have.